26. <laughs> I, I told him yeah, to. Uh, uh, 30 degrees. Sure. I, I told the, the dad joke to the one of the first. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah.
Well, I would wonder, worry about his boundaries. Tom probably became a very interesting, and he's also a professor, so yeah. And so when they got to me, they raved, but I met, but I had pretty in contact with them, and so probably with me. <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning. Please hear these words of remembrance and respect. Place is more than just a piece of land. It is a piece of who we are. For too long, we have associated this place where Judson Church sits with our European American roots. Forgetting the people who called this place home for centuries before us. Many Sota Makucha, land where the waters reflect the sky, and specifically this part of the Twin Cities is the ancestral home of the Dakota Wakaput people. It is home to their creation stories. It is where they hunted, fished, harvested, and cared for the land, raised families, celebrated life and community, and buried their dead. We acknowledge that it was at the hands of European Americans and the federal government of the United States that this land was acquired by treaties and those treaties subsequently broken, forcing the Wapaku into forced removal from their ancestral lands. We acknowledge that Dakota people were imprisoned in concentration camps, suffered starvation, disease, and forced assimilation because of the actions of the government, we the people sanctioned. We remember and recognize the history of this land. We recognize the Dakota, Anishinaabe, and other indigenous people live here today. They are our neighbors and fellow citizens. It is our obligation to do better by our neighbors, to stand with them, and to learn from them as we seek to create a community that sees the creator's face in everything. Welcome to Joseph Memorial Baptist Church. Now we gave um, people, I, this week I gave people options, right? So people were talking and saying, Pastor, I'm not sure uh, which service I should come to. Should I come to the uh, morning service and sit through everything for the hour and then come to Pam's book lunch? Or I uh, just feel like I'm going to be there a long time. And I said, well, if you have an option, I would choose Pam's book lunch. Right? So we want to welcome all those that we know that the extended family that's watching online this morning. Uh, uh, so I know that you're that's what you're doing. So I'm glad that you are doing that. Uh, this week uh, on a Wednesday night, uh, I picked Lori up at the airport. She had been in Oaxaca uh, for a week, and you know uh, there was a long line uh, at baggage claim. And she just said, I'm at the baggage claim, but it looks like it's going to be a while. And so I just sat there uh, waiting for her. And it was one of the most, you know, glorious things to watch. There were the people that were getting picked up by an Uber. And they would walk out with their bag, and they'd have their phone in their hand, and they'd call the driver, and they'd just get in. And then there were these people that were getting picked up by maybe like a loved one, or a family member, or a neighbor. They hadn't seen them in a while. And it was just these giant embraces of hugs and, and tears. Some people are crying, some people are laughing, some people are running to each other uh, to see one another and embrace. You know, I, I don't know how you feel you're welcome this morning. I just hope it's not like an Uber experience, right? Uh, I hope it's somewhere that's, you know, I don't know if you're, maybe your introversion is going to be like, I ah, stay away from those big hugs. I understand that. Uh, but at least we hope that you feel welcome, that you feel loved, and you feel the movement of God, whether you're uh, sitting at your house in your pajamas, or you're sitting here in your, uh, well, your Sunday athleisure wear, right? Uh, um, may we enjoy this uh, time that we are gathered here this morning. The theme is resurrection for the day. You're going to hear that throughout uh, the day. Uh, so just make yourself open to where God takes you as we uh, gather this morning. If you'd like to get a cup of coffee at any time, uh, please do so. And, uh, you know, make yourself comfortable. We're going to be here for about, you know, about an hour. Let's we'll see what happens. Our opening hymn is... Uh, 42. 42. Number 42. And also, we want to say, hey, thanks for... Uh, it's always a glorious Sunday when Carrie Thomas is with us. So, uh, Carrie, thank you for being here. If you get anything out of the service at all today, maybe just some of her melodies take you to a deeper place. And that'll be enough.
got a question of the day. Uh, is when was the last time you had a good cry? Now, you can exercise your own free agency here and say, I don't want to answer that question. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. Maybe you'd like to answer the question, what's the first sign of spring? Or maybe you just want to exit the whole thing and go get a cup of coffee. However you want to do it, right? Just um, try to make it around the, when was the last time you had a good cry, though? Okay. Be back in about 30 seconds.
Thank you, choir. That's Christians. The uh, first lesson comes from the, it's, it's, it's all one giant lesson from the book of John because John doesn't know how to uh, condense things. Uh, and that's okay. That's just who the storyteller was. Um, but a few things you need to know about John before we proceed. Uh, one is that you know, when John was um, being composed, the stories were being collected, that there's a couple things. One, there was a book of signs. So there were seven signs that Jesus did. And those are kind of healing, kind of the miracle of Cana, changing water into wine, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then there are seven I am sayings. You know, I am the good shepherd, I am the true vine, I am the resurrection. Uh, when Jesus, um, there's something about that word, it goes back to, uh, you know, the original Hebrew word for God, which is Yahweh, which people think is a, a, a version of the word to be, which is being. And so you will find in the book, of, uh, later on in the book of John, when Jesus is being arrested and they're asking him, who is Jesus? And Jesus says, I am he. And then all of a sudden everybody gets blown down uh, by some kind of force. So just to give you a little heads up on that. Uh, but we're not going to get into that today, but just so you know what's going on. Um, and, and the other part is, like in the first century, for about the first 150 years, that remember that there is no such thing as a separate... Christian church. What is going on are two reform movements within uh, Judaism. It's not until after the temple is destroyed in the year 70 that then there begins to be really kind of two separate distinct faith traditions. But, you know, but still for that about, up, up for about another, for 150 years the two are kind of parallel tracks, reform movements that are talking to each other quite a bit. And John is one of the is from a group that feels somewhat antagonized by another group. So you will hear phrases in the book of John when you read it, such as, it seems like the Jews, which for us when we read that, it's like, oh my gosh, what are they doing saying that? Uh, but in John's gospel, there is this antagonism between these two groups, but they are not separate. They're still kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a family squabble uh, at this time. So just those are things you probably need to um, we're going to just go to uh, verse about verse 27. Uh, now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with her perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, interesting, that doesn't happen for a couple more chapters, so foreshadowing. Her brother was still ill, so the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, whom you love, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the child of God, the human one, may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after he said this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just trying to stone you. And are you going there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. Then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. And Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was also called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, 
I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the human one, the one coming into the world. Listen to the first lesson. So now I know you're all just with bated breath. What happens? And uh, we'll pick that up in a little bit. Uh, but until then, we've asked Deandra Moore to give a personal reflection. And personal reflections are, um, you know, a great Judson tradition. You know, a time where people have, we say about, what, five to seven minutes to speak your truth. Yeah. So let's welcome Deandra Moore. Yeah. My last reflection went a lot longer than that. So, um, <laughs> that was before the new sound system. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, but then yet yeah, Carlin Gray, who was there, still asked me to do speak, and on the topic of resurrection, in five minutes. <laughs> so here we go. I can do. So good morning. My name is Deidre Moore, and I've been attending Judson since the Advent season of 1999. I arrived with my then husband, Ross, who many of you know had come out as gay, and my two children, Petter and Marin, who were six and eight at the time. We arrived here grieving in the middle of divorce, and you all embraced us. Petter and Marin are now 32 and 31 and living grown-up lives. I married Joe here in 2006 and gained three more children who are all in their 34, 32, and 28. Um, and Joe and I have welcomed two grandchildren and a third to arrive in October. My experience of landing here in Judson was like Dorothy landing in Oz. Um, I'm not in Kansas anymore. Um, some things that made it that way for me were about belief and truth. Comments in sermons disputing the virgin birth, <laughs> teaching the Jonah story as a metaphor or allegory or one of those. Um, and in a small group, one woman stated, um, I don't believe Jesus really rose from the dead, but I do believe in resurrection. So I've pondered these things over the years. And I've struggled often with belief and faith and Jesus all through seminary, ordination papers, and councils. Um, I find I hesitate to actually put pen to paper to say what I think or believe. I just don't want it down in ink. <laughs> um, and Ron Catone spoke at my ordination and he, I, the, the words I remember him saying about me was that I just wanted to understand. Um, something I've had to let go of. <laughs> so for the dictionary, resurrection, capitalized, strictly refers to Christ rising from the dead. And more generally, it means resurgence or revival, an act or an instance of bringing something back to life back to public attention, or vigorous activity. What I've learned from my work at hospice is that before there can be a resurrection or a step over into everlasting life, if that is a person's belief, first there must be a dying. Jesus taught us himself, taught this himself to us, when he said, unless a seed falls to the earth and dies, it cannot produce fruit. And maybe it's his own teaching that gave him hope when he told his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and then he will die and be, be betrayed and died and rise again. Jesus got on his knees in the garden, sweat, blood, and tears, praying to God, if you are willing Please remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. I think that's when Jesus died to himself. Yay. 
We all suffer in this life. I don't know why I'm crying there, but we do. We suffer because we live in this world. Gravity both grounds us and makes us fall. We suffer under the weather. We suffer because we live with others, some who hurt us deliberately or unintentionally. We suffer because we live with ourselves. We hurt others. Our bodies age. We get sick. We die. In all this suffering, we grieve. And we may ask that this cup be removed. So what about resurrection? I've learned that it matters not whether I believe Jesus really rose from the dead. What matters is that I can learn to live into resurrection, to be spiritually awake, to live into willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness. In the same way Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem, I am learning to set my face and intention toward usefulness. Most importantly, remembering that outcomes are not for me to know. Fifty-three years ago, I asked Jesus to be my savior. I was seven, do that. <laughs> Twenty-four years ago, I incredulously prayed on my knees that God would help me get through whatever was to come. Two years ago, I again got on my knees to offer myself to God to do with me as God would. And I've been relieved of compulsive eating. I can now face the past gratefully and look forward hopefully. the resurrection each day I must let go of my little plans and desires I need to connect to God through pausing and asking what's next how can I be useful I draw guidance sometimes from the way of Jesus who abided in God sometimes I am reminded of God's presence by the image of a sea turtle it's amazing how many sea turtles I can see in a day in Minnesota three times one day, beginning, middle, end. I keep a little pin on my horizon, a sea turtle. Sometimes it's a winking goddess who playfully reminds me to let go of all outcomes. I draw guidance from the Bible. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Be anxious for nothing, but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Sometimes it's the Tao Te Ching. The best way is to be like water. Live in accordance with the nature of things. Build your house on solid ground. Keep your mind still when keep your mind still. When giving, be kind. When speaking, be truthful. When ruling, be just. When working, be one pointed. When acting, remember, timing is everything. And sometimes it's a big book of AA. And acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some fact in my life unacceptable to me, and I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it is supposed to be at this moment. Do I always get it right? No. Nope. <laughs> Sometimes I let my little plans and desires take over. Sometimes I'm selfish or dishonest with myself or others. But living into resurrection is not about perfection. It's a way of life that is right there for me to choose any given moment, and I'm grateful for each day when I get to practice that intention. So thank you.
this time in prayer, we're just going to uh, sing one verse of Be Still My Soul. You can remain seated as you uh, do this. For the prayers this morning, I'm just going to ask you, uh, if there's slips of paper around, um, if, if you know, sometimes there isn't a slip of paper, you know, you can tear off a piece of the bulletin or uh, something like that. Um, and we just ask you to, this morning I'm just going to ask you, what is it, is there one person in your life or one situation that you'd really like to pray for? And I'm just going to ask you to come forward and put those in the bowl. We won't read them aloud, but just as a way for us to uh, pray for those this morning. mindful of the, the rugs and the cords just to make sure. Yeah.
know the prayers we bold, but we may also uh, just keep Fran and family in our prayers and just uh, lift them up at this time. Uh, let's think of uh, people that are kind of not here with us this morning just for other health and life circumstances, and we, and we lift those up. We think of our community, this, the, the, the violence that we see, not only just here, but around the world, and so may we uh, try to commit ourselves to ways of peace. So many times that peace is offered as the last option. But what about if it's just a constant re daily renewal of peace in our lives to make it a, a, a lifestyle, not just the last option when there are no other options? Let's be in remembrance of our own health and well-being, and just be in prayer for those around you and your own self. May we lift these up to God at this time, and I'll uh, share a prayer afterwards. God, hear these prayers that have been shared with you, the prayers that are still in our hearts, too private to name or to put on ink, but instead those prayers that are deep within us. We offer them to you at this time. We pray for our own selves. We pray for the, those around us. We pray for those actions that we have done and those actions that have been done to us. The things that we are ready to forgive, let us forgive. And the things that we are not ready to will give us grace to eventually let go. Be with us in this time, and may your peace and guidance guide us. Amen. conversation with Martha. When Martha had finished, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to Jesus. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. And they followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who were also with her weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could he not have, could, could not he, who opened the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, God, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you would always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to him, Unbind him and let him go. Thus ends the lesson for this morning. 
Let us pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. May these words, may this time, may these prayers, may these breaths help us to love thee more than we are capable. Amen. One question. Think about one question that can change your life. Or just one question that can throw you off. We weren't prepared for it. And my father and his friends spent hours upon hours of their lives repairing engines. And I have all this knowledge via osmosis and via uh, you know, doing it myself on repairing engines that are all obsolete. I'll never be able to do it. I still have a desire to, for some odd reason to restore a Volvo 240DL. I never will, but I don't know why I have that. I don't even know anything about all those, but maybe it's from listening to car talk uh, all those years. Who knows? But my dad's friend was working on this Pontiac, and he had restored it perfectly, but it wouldn't start. It just wouldn't turn over. And it, when it did kind of turn over, things weren't working. The engine heated up really quick, and things weren't working. Uh, and he said, I give up. I don't know what to do. My dad asked one question. Did you prime the oil pump? And uh, Ray, my dad's friend, said, oh, yeah, sure, I did that. And uh, you can see this look in his eye that said he had not primed the oil pump. <laughs> and miraculously, the next day, he said, you know, I went home and I just started it up one more time and it started. Oh, you know, uh, One question. One question. Could throw everything off, right? I mean, there was one time I was sitting at a restaurant and there was a couple sitting behind me. It was dark, couldn't really see him, but I heard this question, one question. Why aren't you wearing your ring? Yeah, yeah. One question could throw you off, right? Do you still love me? One question, all it takes. Why are we here? One question is all it takes. You know, we've been looking at the questions that Jesus asked over the past four weeks. If you haven't been here, it's okay. I'm going to give you a little synopsis. Um, you can take that with you. Uh, you know, with 311 questions, Jesus, you know, uh, uh, is asked, you know, um, or 311 questions Jesus asked in the New Testament. Some people say it's 308. Now, why is there a discrepancy? Well, it's a lot of counting, right? I mean, theologians and biblical scholars aren't really good at math. There's that part of it for sure. Uh, but, but also, you know, if, if I just want to give you a little tiny glimpse into what the New Testament was like, you know, in those first few years it was written. It was just one giant word. So the book of John starts and ends. There is no punctuation. There is no little space between words. So think about just a couple years ago. Do you remember that it became acceptable in all written documents that you did not have to put two spaces after a period? You don't have to put one now, right? And some of us drove us absolutely bonkers. Some, and some people still refuse to accept a one uh, space for a sentence. But you got adjusted, your eyes got adjusted. In the first century, you would look at this giant word, and you knew when the words ended, and you knew where the next word began, and you know, it was no problem. But for us, it's a little bit of a problem when you look at it. And people put punctuation in as kind of what they intimated that the text was saying. So, 308, 311, who knows? It could be 312, right? Uh, but the point of it is, Jesus asked a lot of questions. He was asked for himself 183, and he only answers directly, now this is where things get tricky. I count more like around 15, but people say it's eight. Okay, whatever, whatever right? But it, Jesus answers only directly eight questions. So roughly, if you do the math, Jesus is more likely 40 to one to, an, to ask a question than answer one. Which is pretty much what most of us are like too, uh, uh, if you look at the realm. So that's probably 41, it's a pretty good ratio. We've looked at several situations where, one where Nicodemus asks, uh, goes to Jesus at night. Some people have clever, they call it Nick at night, that little text story. Uh, yeah, I know it's tough, I know. There is a story where Jesus asked a Samaritan woman at the well, and then we looked at the blind man, and this morning the text is the Lazarus text, the rising of Lazarus. Now we, we have this family, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This seems to be the family that Jesus goes to when he is worn out, when he's exhausted. 
when he just doesn't know where to go. It's the family he was the closest to. Now, I think you all have people like this in your lives, right? Uh, for me, it was like, you know, when things are really bad, all I really needed was my grandmother to make me a, a loaf of banana nut bread. It's amazing what a banana nut loaf of bread can do for you. Make almost anything go away. A little bit later in life, actually, believe it or not, it was the church that was kind of like the place that filled my soul more than anything. When my parents were fighting and things weren't really all that good at the house, I could go to church and all these old people just loved me up. It was fantastic. I loved it. Who wouldn't love that kind of attention? Some people don't, but that's okay. But we see that this family must have been just the family that Jesus loved. And so we want to look at this point where Jesus weeps, thinking that this must be because these were people that Jesus loved, and they're gone now, and he's dealing with grief. And that's part of it. But just hold on to that thought. Just, we're not ready to go there just yet. The question Jesus asked in the story is, ask you know, Mary and Martha, do you believe? Oh, that's, a really, that's one of those questions. Deidre had said, you know, she didn't want to put what she believes into ink. Isn't that just like all of us? You know, my best, uh, one of my good friends in seminary, a guy named Lawrence Hargrave, he has the greatest uh, email name ever, Jazz Dove. Oh, I tried to steal it, couldn't, uh, I couldn't live up to that anyways. But um, Lawrence had a jazz program, midnight to 3 a.m. Saturdays. He would, he would do the program, drink a whole bunch of coffee, and then preach on Sunday, and then go to sleep the rest of the day. Uh, Lawrence, Lawrence's jazz collection was like what most of our living rooms look like, right? Just about that size, full of LPs. And I was not that uh, knowledgeable of jazz, so I asked Lawrence, Lawrence, what's your, what's your favorite jazz album? And he looked at me and said, you can't ask me that question. Not because we didn't know each other good enough. That was just, you, that's an unfair question to ask. You can't ask me that question, because tomorrow I'm going to give you a different answer. One hour from now I'm going to give you a different answer. And I said, well, well, well where do I start? You can't ask me that either. <laughs> you've, got to go, you've got to do it yourself and find out. Do you believe is the question. And how many of us get hung up on that? Right there at do you believe. You know, do you believe so-and-so, such-and-such? Do you believe the creeds? Do you believe the whatever, right? Uh, do you believe your doctor? Do you believe your nerd, you know, your, your school teacher? Do you believe your parents? All these questions, do you believe? It's a really troubling question. It's one of those you really can't ask. It's one of those questions you can't really answer. I mean, do you believe today what you're going to believe tomorrow? You know, there's probably about, maybe about 20% of the time I believe in the Trinity. Right? That's a good 80% not, you know. It's just some mornings you wake up, you have a cup of coffee, you're like, yeah, I can see that happen. And then, you know, a couple of days later, oh, what, what was I thinking, you know? Uh, all those kind of things go back and forth in our lives. We work if we're honest about this kind of stuff. What do you believe? Do you believe in the resurrection? Like last week, it's the wrong question to ask. It's not that you believe that it happened. Because it's not just one resurrection. You know, we, have, we focus on Jesus' resurrection. But look at the people of Jesus resurrected. There's Lazarus, there's Jairus' daughter, there's other people. And in Hebrews it says that all of us, we could possibly have an even better resurrection than Jesus'. But what does that even mean? I don't know. A better resurrection. Maybe the question we should be answer, answering or at, you know, maybe the question we should be asking and centering on and asking is, you know, do we believe in the practice of resurrection? Do we believe in the practice of resurrection? Love the quick prophet. The annual raise, vacation with pay, want more of everything ready-made. Be afraid to know your neighbors and to die. And you will have a window in your head. Not even your future will be a mystery anymore. Your mind will be punched in a card and shut away in a little drawer. When they want you to buy something, they will call you. When they want you to die for profit, they will let you know. 
So friends, every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, work for nothing, take all that you have and be poor, love someone who does, does not deserve it, denounce the government and embrace the flag. Hope to live in that free republic for which it stands. Give your approval to all who cannot understand. Praise ignorance for what man has encountered he has not destroyed. Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias so that your main crop is the forest that you do not plant. That you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvested when they have rotted into the world. Call that profit. Prophesy such returns. Put your faith in two inches of humus that will be built under the trees every thousand years. Listen to carry on. Put your ear close and hear the faint chattering of the songs that are to come. Expect the end of the world. Laugh. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful that you have considered all the facts. So long as women do not go cheap for power, please, more women more than men, ask yourself, will this satisfy a woman, satis will this satisfy a woman satisfied to bear a child? Will this disturb the sleep of a woman near giving to birth? Go with your love to the fields. Lie easy in the shade, rest your head in her lap, Swear allegiance to what your nighest, to what is nighest your thoughts. As soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark a false trail, the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. Practice resurrection. Do you practice resurrection? Do you look at the possibilities in your life and say, there is something more going on in this heart of mine? There is something more going on in this place that I call home? Do you practice resurrection? We live, I think, in an age of great death, a great determinism of just people that have given up. If there is ever a time to practice resurrection, it's now in this time. There's this great word that we have from theologians. It's one of those words you just like to say. You don't like what it means, but it's a really fun word to say. Immutable. Yeah? Just go ahead and say it with me. Immutable. Immutable, right? It's a terrible word. It means it unaffected, right? And theologians have held this up that God is unaffected by our actions and who we are. And yet we have in this story that Jesus wept that Jesus is somehow affected by us. That the actions of this world have, a, have a, some kind of motioning in God's heart. The text, when you, when you go back and start to unpack the words, and it's not that Jesus is like this feeling of grief and sorrow. It's this feeling that Jesus is really angry. And these tears come out of anger, being disturbed, and deeply moved. He's angry because even though he is the resurrection, he cannot stop death. He cannot stop its power, and he cannot stop, at this time, the grief that it causes his friends. You and I can't walk up to somebody and tell them that they will never die. You and I can't be there when someone is dying and just simply pat them on the back and say, it'll be okay. Because it won't. It'll be a tearing of the soul. It'll be a loss that cannot be replaced. But we can say to other people and to ourselves, I'm going to be here with you. I'm not going to leave your side. That despite the power of death and despite all that's going on, I still believe in love and I still believe it's worth holding your hand through the times and days that we have breath. We are not immutable. We are people with hearts that beat and lungs that breathe 
and hands that need to be held. We are mutable. We are here for each other. And we are here to affect ourselves and one another. And we are here to practice resurrection. Do you believe? It's a wrong question. Are you willing to take a chance and practice resurrection in this day, in this life? That's a question to ask. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, as you come into this world with tears and with healing hands, with questions, and with not too many answers, be with us in this life. Amen. The uh, hymn, we're going to finish up uh, Be Still My Soul. You know, last week I asked you, you know, if you have a, you know, maybe a, a scripture lesson or a hymn or a poem or something that helps you get through the day. I can't tell you how many times I've been kind of standing outside of a room, a hospital room, maybe just a bedroom, or getting ready to see somebody who's got a hard time in life. They're a little bit, this is somebody from a previous generation, and if you're really quiet, you can just hear them humming within the audio. You can hear them humming this song. So I, I just, so that today, maybe all you can do is maybe just try to capture Karen's and Jim's music and have that be with you. That when you're in a bad spot in life, maybe all you can do is just hum this tune for you. Trust me, it'll get you to the next place. Thanks for the So today, at 1 o'clock, Pam Jordan's book launch will take place. One to about, what do you think, Pam? 2.30, 3 o'clock? How long do you think? Yeah. We're going to have Jimmy Langemann give him some music. There's going to be a, a reading, some Q&A, just some wonderfulness going on. Light refreshments. Not really sure what that means, but you kind of know what that means. Uh, so you got that going on. Now, after that, you're probably thinking, what am I going to do before dinner, right? I mean, I've got church. We've got Pam's book launch. At 4 o'clock, there is this... Uh, a spring concert with Caritas for a trust that will be happening. Carla, what church is that at? Diamond Lake Lutheran, Diamond Lake Lutheran Church, right? So there, there's your full day, right? Then you can go home and just be exhausted, right, uh, uh, for that. So 
uh, of that. Okay, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Uh, we've got a great lineup for you. Be great. Uh, let's just put a note in also that April 9th is uh, Easter Sunday, uh, and we will have the Celtic Trio, maybe a quartet. We don't know. We don't know yet. Uh, from the Center for Irish Music that will be here for that. Uh, going on, new members class will be starting in April if you'd like to join. Or maybe you just want to come and find out, or you just want to be a lawyer and find out more information about us. You can do that too. Uh, things that are happening. We have things that are coming up. Uh, we also want to put a plug in for um, Steve Hirsch's, I don't want to put a plug in something like that. I mean, we want to make sure that you know about Steve Hirsch's memorial service that will be Saturday, April 15th at 10 a.m. So what we're going to need, though, is uh, that's also the same day as dinner and a show. So we're going to have to have we're going to have to turn everything over, which we can do. We can do two things on the same day easily. So we're going to have Steve Hirsch's uh, memorial service at ten. There'll be a lunch downstairs, and then we're just going to need you to help clean up the sanctuary and uh, the downstairs and get it ready for dinner and a show. Now Doug is going to be handing out these little blue note cards to you as you exit the uh, worship service, and uh, this is a little note card for you to both maybe put on your refrigerator. Maybe you put, maybe you, you send it as a postcard to someone else, or maybe, maybe you just have fun and you put it in somebody's book in the library, and um, you know they get to see it and think about it. So uh, there's all the kind of things you can uh, do for these things. So plenty of great things going on. Take a look in the uh, bulletin and take this home with you and think about it and look at all those great things going on and think about that. And uh, just last, I'll leave you. Did you all notice the Twins' home opener this year is during Holy Week? Could it be a more fitting way? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, uh, so, hopefully, that your baseball is getting ready and you feel good about that. Scott Simpson's got another thing about the fun fair. You've got a note about it in your bulletin. There's a maybe you got a, a letter at home. You've seen it in the email. If you haven't signed up for the email, please sign up. We send them out on Wednesdays and Fridays. They're fantastic. You will love them. Trust me. Um, if you do, some people do decide that they don't want them anymore, and that's okay. But, um, you know, that happens. We, we don't take it personal. We do, but still, it yeah, happens. Um, uh, that some fun fair stuff. Okay, great things going on. We're seeing now this blessing, and then we're going to be doubly blessed with the uh, music, the credit post. Uh, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, go down with this deep peace. That it's not about the questions that you don't have answers for. Go with this deep peace. It's that, it's that you are asking the questions till you find the right one. Keep asking. Keep searching. And know that whatever answer you come up with, it's not the final one. It's just the one for that day. If you need one thing, take deep peace that Jesus is the question to all of your answers. Call into question what you think is true and vital and keep going. And know that in this journey that you are not alone, that there are hands to hold, that there are meals to be shared, and there are hearts to be with.
text me. Okay. Just, yeah, I'm uh, just going to keep it in my office, so when you're ready, yes. to get it. Yes. Oh, yeah. I hopefully. Wait a second. Okay. All right. Sounds good.
Oh yeah, you know I meant to tell everybody what it was. Uh, the mad uh front Wendell Bear. Wendell Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got kind of in myself. Yeah, yeah. Did you have spring break yet? No, wow. Well, I mean, I mean like the yeah, yeah, my, to try that. Uh, okay, Susan had her like two weeks ago, and then yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I was supposed to be like, yeah. Oh, fantastic. From Thursday, from Wednesday. Oh, yeah. But I, I can't go because I'm working. Oh, like, that's my real spring break. Like, <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, mostly just like, you know, watch things by myself. Yeah. Or, like, yeah. you know, do a few projects around. But, yeah. 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 I mean, like, I can just, I don't have to think anybody else. No, it's just like, yeah. Stay at the office a little late. Like, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Myself or something. Like, yeah. It's, it's going to be nice to have. No, those are neat times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was reading in the Times in the film review the other day. There was this new movie coming out with Richard III. Oh yeah, The Lost yeah. King. Yeah, it looked kind of fun. Like, it did it was look kind fun. of a weird. Yeah. Weird I mean, because it, it was, they did find one. Uh, right. In the church parking lot. Right. Right. Yeah. They, they, yeah. They found it. So, like, yeah. yeah. It looks like a quirky. Yeah. Yeah. Movie. That made me kind of interested. Yeah. 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 So what are you working with? Uh, what are you at? Uh, are you getting something working on it as a project or? Yeah. I'm, or actually, I'm teaching a class that I have only taught once before. Yeah. Uh, and it's like it's got a kind of civic engagement component. So I'm working with a couple of different uh, yeah. projects, but it's all about like mapping, like using various different digital mapping technologies to yeah. tell okay. kind of multi-local place-based stories. Uh, so that should be fun. Um, but I'm also I've got a couple of projects that I'm just trying to finish up. We're working for like almost two years. Oh, okay. A colleague yeah. on, a, on an article that we like presented at various stages, and it's yeah. real close. And like, yeah. we wanted this past week to be like the week we finished it, and then like live intervene with both of us. Yeah. So like, we're not quite there yet, but yeah. it's like so close to coming out door. So like, that, that's the main thing that I'm trying to. Do. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. That is fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh yeah. Sure. <coughs> What's going on, Van? I'm fine. I'm coming to say good job. Okay, let's do this right here.